Shalom, shalom, peace and blessings. Now let's get straight into it. So today's lesson is a continuation of the sun worship agenda. And the reason that we're continuing to dive into this topic is because of, well, really because of this verse, let's just bring it out. Let's go straight into it. Let's get Ephesians chapter six and verse 12. For we, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world. All right. There's darkness in this world. And if you don't have this revealed to you, you're going to be in the darkness against spiritual wickedness in high places. So there's spiritual wickedness in high places that most people are just not aware of. And really understanding some of the information that we go over, because, you know, like I said last time, this is really just barely scratching the surface. But understanding some of this information, it really brings you know, the scriptures together, it gives you the full picture. All right. It really gives you the full picture of what was going on with Israel and what's going on with Israel today. Meaning our people, the so-called black man and woman um, of this captivity. All right. And why we stay in captivity and why we stay in bondage and the different deceptions and games that these people are playing nowadays. Right. But it's nothing new under the sun. It's always been that way. But I like to, to bring it all together so we can see different things that these people are doing. To be more specific, you know, the so-called elite, the different gods that they worship and the way that they show you that they worship these gods and how they have the masses of people willingly or unwillingly uh, submitting to the same deities. But Let's jump back in. So last time we were here in this solar deity uh, page here in Wikipedia. So it says a solar deity or sun deity is a deity who represents the sun or an aspect of it. Okay. Such deities are usually associated with power and strength. Okay. Solar deities is sun worship can be found throughout most of recorded history in various forms. It's all nations have a, um, a form of sun worship. Okay. S U N and really S O N too. And as we go through this, we're going to see that's kind of one in the same, but what does that really represent? When someone says they worship the sun, is it that they literally worship the star of the sun? Or is it something else? All right. The sun is sometimes referred to by its Latin name, Sol, or by its Greek name, Helios. The English word sun derives from pro-Germanic, Germanic, Suno. All right. So what I wanted to jump back into is the aspect of the bull. We touched on it briefly in part one, but let's go back here again. It says... Other early Egyptian myths imply that the sun is incorporated with the lioness Sekhmet at night and is reflected in her eyes, or that the sun is found with the cow Hathor during the night and reborn each morning as her son, and it has in parentheses, bull. So I wanted to bring something out um, about the bull that we didn't. Uh, get a chance to touch on last time we were talking about the Chicago Bulls and how the bull is also a solar deity or at least it, it can be a solar deity depending on uh, a person's worship system but let's go back here we, we touched on this briefly the Apis bull it says Apis deity in ancient Egyptian religion Apis or Hapis alternately um Alternatively spelled Happy Ankh was a sacred bull worshipped in the Memphis region. Identified as the son of Hathor, a primary deity in the pantheon of ancient Egypt. Initially, he was assigned a significant role in her worship, being sacrificed and reborn. 
So you'll see a lot of that in the different quote unquote sun deities that they're sacrificed and reborn. Now, a lot of people, especially those of our people that believe that, you know, we're really from ancient Kemen and we're really Egyptians and, you know, all this other nonsense that's, you know, on the left hand path of the scriptures. But what we'll see is the sacrifice and reborn um, deity prevalent in their ideologies. And most people think that it's, you know, that the scriptures copied these deities because they quote unquote came first, but it's really the opposite. All right. The prophecy of Yahweh being born and then rising again, you know, that that prophecy was orally told, you know, way back in the days of Shem. OK, so it was already known. And then you had the ancient Egyptians through Ham, you know, um, Ham and his progeny, all right, the Hamites that took that prophecy that they were told to by Noah because Noah knew that prophecy. And then, you know, they went and try to recre recreate it on their own. But there's only one Yahweh Shai. All right, there's only one Christ, at least on the right hand path there is and on the left hand path. There's many of them, just like this app is bull. But again, um, that you know, that's a whole nother story, what I just mentioned there. But the whole point is, is that you're going to see these, you know, being sacrificed and reborn. Just don't get confused and say, wait a second. You know, I thought Christ was the only one that was, you know, quote unquote, sacrificed or was killed and then reborn. All right. No, that's true. But on the left hand path, they just mock the prophecy. You understand? OK, later, Apis also served as the intermediary between humans and other powerful deities, originally Ptah, later Osiris and then Atum. So these deities, uh, Ptah, prevalent, you know, inside of ancient Egypt, Osiris, definitely in Atum, too, as well. I believe he's like the creator God, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but let's keep going. So the Apis bull was a, was an important sacred animal to the ancient Egyptians. Now, let's see that in the scriptures, because what we have to understand is that, again, in the scriptures, sometimes they don't give you the deity's name on the left hand path. A lot of times they do, you know, it, Baal and Baal worship is, you know, all over the scriptures as far as, you know, when our people went off on it and then when the other nations, um, when they were worshiping that deity and the other deities names too, as well, you got Dagon in there, so on and so forth. But, uh, you know, a lot of times they don't actually give you the names, but, you know, there's actual specific deities that our people were worshiping. Um, if you know what you're looking at, for example, let's go to Exodus chapter 32 and verse one, it says the golden calf. And when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mount, the people gathered themselves together unto Aaron and said unto him, Up, make us gods which shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man that brought us out of the land of Egypt, we would not what is become of him. So this, of course, was when Moses went up. He was receiving the commandments, the statute laws and commandments from the most high. OK. And in the time that he was gone, our people already <laughs> wanted to worship something. It's just kind of like our people now. All right. Our people it's like we we program to have an affinity to, to worship the most high worship, you know, some power. But it's just, you know, more times than not, it's just that energy is directed in the wrong direction just like right here okay our people been doing that so when you see our people going off man it ain't nothing new under the sun verse 2 and Aaron said unto them break off the golden earrings which are in the ears of your wives of your sons and of your daughters and bring them unto me and all the people break off the golden earrings which were in their ears and brought them unto Aaron and he received them at their hand 
and fashion it with a graving tool after he had made it a molten calf. And they said, These be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. So we read about Apis being, you know, an important sacred animal in ancient Egyptians to the ancient Egyptians. And you have to understand that, you know, our people just got out of the land of Egypt right around this time, you know. Um, so this is the same God more than likely that, you know, Aaron was fashioning this, you know, the gold earrings and um, the gold after the, this is the golden calf. All right. So if we go to, uh, let me go to golden calf. Or just the word calf here. Go to the word calf. It says calf or bullock. Egel, at least in the modern Hebrew. And that's Strong's H5695. Okay. Egel from the same of H696, a male calf, a frisking round, especially one nearly grown, a steer, bullock, calf. So these are the different deities that our people were worshiping back then. All right. But again, it's still prevalent now. So I'm not saying that, you know, I'm, the point of me going into this is that there's nothing new under the sun. And, you know, that's why you see the bull being prevalent now. And that kind of leads us here into the energy drink known as Red Bull. But we've all heard of this before, right? It says Red Bull is a brand of energy drinks. Or maybe y'all drinking this, <laughs> this crap. Uh, I have before, too. So I ain't, I ain't on your head. Red Bull is a brand of energy drinks created and owned by the Australian company Red Bull GmbH. With a market share of 38%, it is the most popular energy drink brand as of 2019 and the third most valuable soft drink behind a brand behind Coca-Cola and Pepsi. Since its launch in 1987, more than 100 billion cans of Red Bull have been sold worldwide, including over 11.5 billion in 2002. Um, excuse me, 2022. So the reason we go in here is take a look at their logo, Red Bull. Now you see the, the two bulls, right? But what you also see in the background, you see a picture of the sun. I'm just here to tell you that a lot of these major companies the different logos that they have, the name of their companies, the colors that they use, all these types of things is all intentional. And nine times out of 10, depending on what the company is and all these different companies and a quote unquote Fortune 500, Fortune 1, whatever, they all major Luciferian companies, all right? And they use symbology um, on purpose. So this essentially at least in my perspective, would be an allusion to Apis or any type of, you know, bull deity because they have the sun in the background. All right. Again, this is <laughs> Apis was a solar deity or is a solar deity. That's why they have that sun in the background. Now, if you think I'm capping, let's just kind of take a look at some here. Take a look at this video. It says Red Bull cartoon ad. TVC. Okay, now on this video, let me see larger. So on this video, I don't think you guys can hear it, but after a marvelous innings, the batsman nears his century. Yeah, you guys can't hear this, so let's let's kind of go in here. What's this? A streaker and the boys in blue. Goodness me, what a chase. I wonder when the coppers will catch him. Alright, let's keep going. You see that? So I guess this is a sport cricket that they're playing and they're trying to say that, you know, that shot was, he scored a six, but look at this. One, two, three, you got three sixes on the screen, right? For six, six, six. Do you think that's, you know, on accident? Red Bull just 
kind of put this on here. They didn't really know what was going on. No, they did this on purpose. And if you know a little bit about the left-hand path, you'll see that they intentionally used the colors red and, and blue, which are colors that symbolize as above, so below. Up is down, down is up. Okay. The, uh, the twin pillars of masonry. All right. Duality. But anyways, if you're not familiar with all that, the point is, is that look at this 666 on screen here. All right. Showing you the Red Bull is showing you what they really about. Okay. Let's get Revelation chapter 13 and verse 18. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast. A bull is a beast, right? For it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred three score and six. Three score, we know, is sixty. So six hundred six six hundred sixty six. Okay, six six six. That's the number of the man, or the number of the beast. Meaning man in his carnal form, all right, uh, away from the most high, pursuing the left hand path. Any man that, you know, that does that, he's with the lot of the beast. He's with the lot of carnality of the, of the man. Okay. And that's what that number represents. All right. Let's get Psalm chapter 49. And then let's go straight to verse 12. It says, Nevertheless, man being in honor abideth not. He is like the beasts that perish. So, you know, I could go back. I think we went into Psalms 49 in the last um, lesson. But the, the point here is that, you know, man in his bestial state, you know, not keeping the statute laws and commandments of the Most High, He's just like the beast that perish, okay? Just like a beast. A beast lives out on instincts, okay? And a beast can't, you know, they can't keep the statute laws and commandments of the Most High, okay? And they just go by instincts. They don't have a, a thought process. They just kind of doing what they want. And that's exactly what man is without the guidance and direction of the Most High, just like the beast that perish, and then, you know, just kind of like what we talked about on the, the hell lesson, you know, once you're a beast, I mean, not once you're a beast, but once you perish as a beast, okay, any animal, rather, you know, it's, it's a wrap for you. And there's no judgment for each individual dog that dies and they're going to be brought back, okay, in the resurrection. It ain't going to go down like that. But essentially what I'm trying to say here is that let's get verse 20 man that is in honor and understand him not is like the beast that perish okay Red Bull understands that Red Bull the company okay they want to represent the beast and we know that in the book of Daniel and of course like we saw just in the book of Revelation 2 as well we know what the beast represent the other nations okay so yeah, and just in case you thought I was capping, <laughs> you see, you know, they being very blatant with it. A lot of these commercials, they do things like this. But I see a lot of times nowadays where they don't put this out as open. It's weird because I feel like things are way more open and blatant now. But something as easy as 666, since a lot of people know about it. They try to hide it a bit more, but uh, some of the other imagery and numbers, Luciferian hand symbols, so on and so forth is way more blatant. If you know, you know, if you know a little bit about this stuff, you know, it's just getting more and more blatant because they're really trying to show you what they're about nowadays. OK. But again, um, a bull, we're going to see what a bull represents. Let's get Psalms chapter 22 and verse 12. It says, many bulls have compassed me. Strong bulls of Bashan have beset me round. We know this is David. So David is talking about the wicked here. If we go all the way up from the top. Okay. David is talking about the wicked. All right. And 
Matter of fact, let's just get some of it here. Uh, let's get verse one in Psalm chapter 22. Okay. It says to the chief musician upon Ajaleth Shahar, a Psalm of David. My God, my God, or my power, my power, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me and from the words of my roaring? O oh, my power, I cry in the daytime, but thou hearest not, and in the night season, and am not silent. But thou art holy, O thou that inhabitest the praises of Israel. Our fathers trusted in thee, they trusted, and thou didst deliver them. They cried unto thee, and were delivered. They trusted in thee, and were not confounded. But I am a worm. And no man, a reproach of men and despise of the people. All they that see me laugh to scorn. They shoot out the lip. They shake the head saying, he trusted on the most high that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him seeing he delighted in him. So what David is saying here is, is going to be, you know, it's going to come back here on the earth. All right. You know, when, when things really shake off with our people, what the scriptures call Jacob's trouble. All right. The other nations, you know, they're going to laugh when I say us. They're going to laugh us or when I say us, meaning our people, not actually me and that lot. But um, they're going to laugh us to scorn because, you know, our people are going to be trusting on the most high to deliver us. All right. And other nations, they just don't understand. Because when you read scriptures like this and they start coming to life, you're going to know, you know, it just it increases your faith even more. But anyways, but thou art he that took me out of the womb. Thou didst make me hope when I was upon my mother's breast. I was cast upon thee from the womb. Thou art my power from my mother's belly. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, for there is none to help. Many bulls have compassed me. Strong bulls of Bashan have beset me round. They gape upon me with their mouths as a ravening and roaring lion. I am poured out like water and all my bones are out of my joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted in the midst of my bowels. So it says, you know, David said here, Many bulls have compassed me. What does that mean? Was David saying that he was, you know, out in, the, out in the field and there was literal bulls compassing him around or surrounding him? Strong bulls of Bashan. Well, remember, you know, with sun deities, what do they represent? Okay. Power. Such deities are usually associated with power and strength. And that's why, that's, and that's truly why, you know, a bull represents really to the, the other nations, but could even on the right hand side represent power and strength. Okay. Now, in this case, what David is talking about is the leaders or those of the other nations that's in rulership. Many bulls have been past me. Strong bulls of Bashan have beset me around. Okay, because normally that's what the horn represents, right? A horn represents strength. All right, it represents rulership. But that's what David is saying here. And that's why, you know, you have the bull represented um, as uh, strength and power. Okay, because of course we know a bull is a, is a powerful beast, right? All right. Let's go to the word Bashan that was used here. Okay. It says Bashan, Bashan, Hathor, Ja'ar, um, Havath, Ja'ar, and then Bashan, fruitful. And also, yeah, that's another part of sun deities. And normally are a representation of fruitfulness too as well. All right. A district east, east of the Jordan known for its fertility which was given to the half tribe of Manasseh. Okay, so we know this is, you know, over there in Israel, Bashan is, but 
And it says, Smooth and Fertile, Bashan first mentioned as Kingdom of Og, east of Jordan. But here in Psalms chapter 22, David is not particularly talking about the location as Bashan. Because we know in the scriptures, like for example, I mean, we got many examples here we can go to. But let's go here to Isaiah chapter 1. And then let's go to verse 9. It says, Except Yahweh or the Most High or power of hosts had left us, left unto us a very small remnant, we should have been as Sodom and we should have been like unto Gomorrah. Verse 10, hear the word of the Most High, ye rulers of Sodom, give ear unto the law of our God, ye people of Gomorrah. So all throughout the scriptures, sometimes you see similitudes to different nations, different locations, different people. When it's really referring to you know, the people that are in rulership at the time or the other nations as a whole, it's just you know put as a collective like in Ezekiel chapter 38, where you see, um, and hopefully this is making sense to y'all, where you see, <clears throat> set thy face against Gog, the land of Magog, and the prince of Meshech and Tabal. So Gog and Magog is, is not particularly talking about um, the nation of Gog in, in the land of Magog, per se, is really talking about the nation that's going to be in rulership at the end times, which is, you know, Esau. So when it says the strong bulls of Bashan, it's talking about the rulers of those that were in rulership at that time, but also those. You know, it is double fold, double fold for today because many bulls are compassing us around now. Strong bulls of Bashan have been set me around. But the whole point of me going into this is so we can see the, the symbology there with the bull. OK, and kind of linking it to what we were talking about um, in the last lesson with the Chicago Bulls. But. Anyways, uh, Psalm chapter 75 and verse 10, all the horns of the wicked also will I cut off, but the horns of the righteous shall be exalted. So remember, the horn means power. OK, we, we see that all throughout the scriptures, too, as well. Let's go to Strong's because I saw this definition and it kind of um, brought it home what the horn represents. It says Strong's G2768, Karas. It says horn. So this is the um, word used many times in the quote unquote New Testament for the word horn. Okay, it says horn of animals. Since animals, especially bulls, defend themselves with their horns, the horn with the Hebrews and of other nations is a symbol of strength and courage. And use as such in a variety of phrases. You see? That's why you see the word horn used. All right, it says a mighty and valiant helper, the author of deliverance of the Messiah. So on the right hand side, we have Yahweh being the horn of Israel. But then on the left hand path, if you believe in those ideologies, you have the Apis bull and all the different deities that have horns. Why do you think the, the devil has horns? It's to show him as the, the God of the underworld. Okay. Now, um, when I say the devil, I mean just in the illustrations that, like if I was just to pull up the devil, he'd probably have horns, right? But that image was selected like that for a reason. The scriptures never outlined that, that <laughs> Satan got horns, literal horns, and he read and all that stuff, you know, that depiction was actually, you know, created like that on purpose. All right. Uh, uh, project an extremity in a shape like a horn, a point apex as of an altar. But that's pretty much what I wanted to cover on, on bulls per se, um, just to, to show you 
to as well. Um, in the word horn use, uh, H7161, the word horn used in the quote unquote Old Testament or in the Hebrew. It says horn of strength, a flask, container for oil. <laughs> I was going to say something on that. I'm going to leave that alone. Horn as musical instrument. Horn of horn like projections on the altar. And it says of rays of light. Okay, heal. A place conquered by Israel, probably in Bashan. So you also will always see the horn being likened to a ray of light. Because a horn and a ray of light is kind of similar, right? The way that it looks. Okay. But again, uh, the Apis bull and the different uh, deities that have horns, that you will see the different pagan deities with horns. That's what this represents. Uh, for them, it represents that deity being powerful, or having strength, or being a ruler. Okay. Hopefully that makes sense. And uh, But again, a ray of light. Remember, knowledge is likened into light, right? So that also means the same thing. You know, on the right-hand path, Yahweh Shai is that ray of light to the nation of Israel. But on the left-hand path, Apis and all the different deities, they're a ray of light to them. That knowledge on the left-hand path, which is anything, the left-hand path is essentially anything that's not of the most high, okay? Uh Transgenderism, homosexuality, um, you know, not following the dietary law, uh, not keeping the, the holy Shabbat, all these different things. That's just all their ray of light, their ray of knowledge on how they believe they're supposed to do things. OK. But this is just a symbology that they are throw out in your face and you not really know what's going on. You'll think that Red Bull just happened to pick this logo with the sun in the background for no reason. And not saying that you have to look at every company and know exactly what's going on. But I'm just saying, you know, these people, they have a, a deep knowledge of the left hand path understanding. And I say these people, these companies, um, especially the, the nation that's in rulership right now, Esau, the so-called white man, they have a deep understanding of these things. OK, so. They'll throw it in your face constantly. Well, let's get Proverbs chapter 11 and verse 1. It says, A false balance is abomination to the Lord, but a just weight is his delight. So anytime you have a right-hand path, you have to have a left-hand path. Anytime you have righteousness, you have to have wickedness. That's just how that goes. Okay, let's get... Ecclesiasticus or Sirach chapter 33 and verse 14. It says, good is set against evil and life against death. So is the godly against the sinner and the sinner against the godly. So look, verse 15, so look upon all the works of the most high and there are two and two and one against another. I'm bringing this out to say that, you know, one of the purposes of going over this lesson is to make an easier distinction between the right hand and the left hand path. Because a lot of times they're just kind of, you know, put together. Satan's whole goal, or at least one of his goals, is to deceive, right? And the, the best way to deceive somebody is to have things that look innocent or just look like it's righteous or just something, you know, in the middle. And then it's, it's actually wicked. OK, am I saying that if you drink a Red Bull energy drink, you represent, you know, <laughs> the number of the beast? No, I'm just saying that you know, that's the energy these companies are pushing. OK. And if you're not careful, you know, you won't won't see these things and you will kind of cap a Red Bull thinking that. You know, things are all good. It's not. Now, let's get Matthew chapter 10 and verse 16, because we did talk about um, the serpent in last in the last lesson. Or we were getting right there to it, talking about the serpent and this symbology with the sun. 
Let's get Matthew chapter 10 and verse 16. It says, Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. This is Yahweh speaking, or Christ. Be ye therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Now, if we see here, Yahweh told us to be wise as serpents. Now, is Yahweh telling us, like for example, let's get Genesis chapter 3 and verse 1. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Most High had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath the Most High said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of, fruit of the trees of the garden. But of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, the Most High hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. For the Most High doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. So am I saying that, or is Yahweh saying there when... He told us in Matthew 10 and 16 to be wise as serpents. Is he saying to be cunning like the serpent of the garden? All right. Or, you know, the different characteristics that we see of the serpent. But on the left hand path, no, he's referring to on the right hand path because the serpent is just a symbology or it's um, it, it's associated with wisdom. The, the serpent is okay and that could be on the right hand path or on the left hand path again what is the left hand path anything that's contrary to the scriptures all a part of this world you know anything that's a part of this world is the left hand path all right christianity uh, christianity energy christy christian oh my goodness christianity all right islam um, so on and so forth. Okay. All Luciferian, all left hand path, um, ideologies. That's not a part of the scriptures. Okay. Like in, you know, in the church system in Christianity, the God of the church is really to moves. Okay. The God of the church is Apis, is Baal, all the different left-hand path pagan deities it's not yahweh it's not christ because what do they teach in the church that the law is done away with that's a left-hand path ideology that's you know that's a worldly doctrine okay and these things are coming at us left and right up and down all the time constantly on the news there's a different doctrine there's a different you know ideology being pushed down your throat but it's all of the world, okay? But I wanted to go into that so we can see that a serpent in itself could mean um, enlightenment on the right-hand side, but when you see it being, you know, when you see the serpent being used out here in the world in the different forms, it's normally the, the left-hand path that they're trying to teach you about. Which that leads us to the rapper Drake and I said that we would go into that last, <clears throat> excuse me, I said I would, we would go into that last time. Um, but first, matter of fact, before I get to Drake, let's talk about um, something really quickly to work ourselves up to that. Let's go back into Horus because we, we saw Horus last time. Horus or Haru or Hor in ancient, e in ancient Egyptian is one of the most significant ancient, ancient Egyptian deities who served many functions, most notably as God of kingship, healing, protection, the sun, and the sky. So this deity in, in his different forms are still worshiped today. Okay, if you know what you're looking at, these people will tell you what, they, what they're doing. When I say these people, um, the different quote-unquote celebrities, um, the different heck even uh <laughs> the different um politicians and uh, athletes things of that nature they'll let you know 
This is the deity that they worship, if you know what you're looking at. Okay. Um, personal information says Consort, Hathor, Isis, Circuit, Nephthys, um, Anubis, siblings, Beset, parents, Osiris and Isis, Osiris and Nephthys, Hathor. But I wanted to go here. Let's go to Sky God because remember... Um, we had the, the movie Air by Michael Jordan we were talking about and how Michael Jordan is likened it to a god of the, the sky or the, or the god of the air, just like Horus is. Okay, so you can worship Michael Jordan and worship different athletes and, and not even realize what you're doing. Okay, since Horus was said to be the sky, he was considered to also contain the sun and moon. Egyptians believed that the sun was his right eye and the moon is his left and that they traversed the sky when he, a falcon, flew across it. So let's take a look at this because I put this as the thumbnail of the last lesson. Um, it says a ram headed bird representing a ba of Ra with shin rings in his grass. And these are shin rings, but we we're not going to go into all of this. Just the point I wanted to, I mean, the point I wanted to bring out to show y'all is look at this, um, look at this ram headed bird here. And what does this look like? It looks like the Air Jordan 1 logo, right? It looks just like it. You could say this is a reach if you want to. I got another picture. Well, let me show you this too. It says history of the Air Jordan Wings logo. So they have these different logos that you think, you know, somebody just kind of created and, you know, something like that. But it's almost never the case. All right. Uh, with different athletes like uh, Steph Curry, if you look at his logo with uh, who is Steph Curry with again? Not New Balance. Um, let me just pull it up, Steph. Curry logo. Look at his logo, man. With unarmor, that's right, y'all. Unarmor. That's a six six six. Blading. That's all that is. They put it. They they're acting like oh, it's. It's when you shoot a three, you put up the three, the quote unquote, okay sign. No, it's not. Okay. And Steph Curry knows that too as well. I know that he, uh, <laughs> he portrays himself to be like a Christian, but you know, if he really was about it, then he wouldn't have tattoos. Of course, some of us didn't know beforehand but i'm just saying for him and anyways yeah, this is 666 so a lot of times with these logos they know exactly what they're doing but let's let's go back here with michael jordan excuse me so michael jordan says michael jordan is known by many nicknames mj black cat his airness showing that you know, you, you only say that to, you know, a ruler or even a god, his his airness or his highness or, or, or something like that. It says goat, but none compared to the nickname that became a shoe and a brand, Air Jordan. Okay, we could go down, but I wanted to show you all this. Look at this. So as you see Michael Jordan kind of standing here, you see that sun in the background. Now, again, this is a lot of times you'll see something like this and it's just going to go completely over your head. But they put this sun back here on purpose because, again, that's what he represents. Michael Jordan, as in what he's portrayed as, is a sun deity, a sky deity. All right. And hopefully that makes sense to y'all. All right. Michael Jordan represents Horus, Haru. Apis, so on and so forth. That's why they got the sun in the background. All right, he's here to deliver the light, but on the left-hand path. Okay, if you follow him as a god. But 
yeah, this is where the inspiration of that logo came from. All right, this this wing sun is it was prevalent. All right, in different cultures too as well in Babylon. All right, you had the winged sun. But let's look at the ancient Egyptian winged sun for now. Because I think on the thumbnail, I used the Babylonian form. Okay, on the, one of the Babylonian gods that had the winged sun. Okay, it says the winged sun, sometimes known as Behedeti, a name of Horus, is a symbol in ancient Egyptian religion associated with divinity, royalty, and power in ancient Egypt. The symbol is attested from the own kingdom. The winged sun is symbolic also of the eternal soul. When placed above the doors, excuse me, when placed above the temple doors, it served as a reminder, <laughs> so like it has a reminder to the people of their eternal nature. The winged sun was linked to the falcon god Horus. However, it was associated with the sun god Ra in the wings of Horus, the omnipotence of Ra. Okay, so what we see here on this winged sun is also the serpent, right? You see the serpent coming on both sides attached to the sun. So, the serpent has always been associated with the sun. Okay, again, um, that could be on the right hand side loosely, but normally, again, especially when you see something like this, it's associated with the left hand path. Okay. And I think we brought this out last time, but since we went over, um, since we went over certain things, let me grab this again. Romans 1 and 23. All right. Start 21. Because that when they knew the most high, they glorify him not as God. Neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible, uncorruptible power into an image made like to corruptible man. Again, the image made like into cor corruptible man is not only like the different gods, Apollo, this image of a corruptible man, but also, you know, on a looser base level is the different images now of men that are positions as gods. Okay, and to birds, right, to falcons, like we just read, and to four-footed beasts, we read about the Apis bull, and creeping things, which is a serpent, okay? So, these are the different images that are put out to our people and put out to the masters, really, to get us to continue down that left-hand path, all right? Those energies, man, is is not... You know, seeing something like this is not going to just make you say, oh, what? You know what? I see a sun in the background. Let me just go be a Luciferian today. Or if you see this, this logo, you know, <laughs> you're probably going to see this and think consciously in your head. Oh, man, this is the the ancient Egyptian winged sun logo. Let me go study, you know, ancient Kemet. Or ancient Egypt now. It's not about that. It's about subconsciously having that left hand path energy, you know, bestowed upon you. You not even realize it. Okay. It's just constantly working against you again. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers or the, the horns or the, the bulls of Bashan of the darkness of this world against spiritual wickedness in high places. It's just spiritual wickedness. So it's actually important that you understand these things are coming your way because it, it does nothing but continue to, to throw you off if you're not strong in the spirit. Okay. Now, finally, back to the serpent. So we saw the back over here to Apollo. 
we saw Apollo as the patron deity of Delphi. All right, and then we looked up Delphi. And then we saw, it says, according to Suda, and I'm going through this because we went through this in the last lesson. Delphi took his name from Delphi, the she-serpent, Dracaena, who lived there and was killed by the god Apollo. In other accounts, the serpent was a male serpent, Dracon, Python. So that kind of leads us here. Now take a look here at the rapper Drake and his son Adonis. Okay, his son's name is Adonis. Now if you see here, if you know what you're really looking at, you'll notice that Drake's left eye is only revealed here. There's a reason for that. Um, but also we see his son uh, Adonis. It's a reason he, he kind of throwing up these, these peace signs too, but we'll, we'll say that for another day. But what am I getting at here with this rapper Drake and his son? What does that have to do with, you know, sun worship, um, Apis, uh, serpents, so on and so forth? What does this have to do with anything? Let's make the correlation here. Now, I said this in the last lesson. The word Drake just means a serpent. Okay, you got etymology.com and we looked up the word Drake. Definition number one says male of the duck, um, circa 1300s, unrecorded in Old English, but it might have existed from West Germanic Draco. But let's go down to definition two. It says dragon, circa 1200, really this way before that, from Old English Draco, dragon, sea monster, huge serpent. Look, Drake is called Drake for a reason, okay? Drake just really means serpent. A lot of these entertainers, they're given these code names for a very specific reason, okay? And this, you know, normally it's something involved with the left-hand path. Like uh, there's this, this rapper, um... I guess a new rapper, her name is Kylie. Let's see, I guess it's, it's her right here. That's another one. I guess there's a lot of Kylie's. Wow, it's a whole nother Kylie. Uh, Kylie rapper. Yeah, this, this person right here. Her name is Kylie. Okay. American rapper from Roswell, Georgia of Panamanian descent so they're giving these code names her name is supposed to be Kalia Ashley Ross known professionally as Kali nah there's a reason she was given this name this is a code name okay she is named after the goddess Kali okay they, they do these things on purpose it's not a coincidence so again with Drake there's a reason he was given that name Drake okay it stands for the serpent, but of course not the serpent, um, a serpent on the right hand side, but a serpent on the left hand side. Because the idea is that Drake is here to keep you going down that left hand path. What is all his music about? Number worldly stuff, right? The more you listen to that and ingest that as taking it for serious doctrine, the more you're going to continue down the left hand path. It doesn't have to be anything as serious as, you know, having an idol in your um, in your house and you actually kneeling down to it. That's what most people think the left hand path is. You have to have some deity that you literally bow into. No, nah. as long as you're not putting the most high first and keeping the statute laws and commandments to the best of your abilities, then you're pretty much going off. <laughs> Anyways. If you hold someone like a Drake, a Michael Jordan, a LeBron James, any actor or actress or whatever the case, if you hold them in high regards in the most high, that's idolatry. You see? So it doesn't have to be anything serious like that. When I say serious, at least, it doesn't have to be that deep. It doesn't have to be anything like you got a picture of Drake in your house and you kneeling down and praying to Drake. No, that's not the point. 
again, um, as long as you have that person um, and you regard them more than the most high, then you're going off. You are going down the left-hand path because you're either hot or you cold, okay? But these types of things are, are put out here, these deceptions, all right? If you're, you know, if you're not careful, you'll fall for it. Let's go to Revelation chapter 12 and verse 9. It says, And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceived the whole world. He was cast out into the earth and his angels were cast out with him. So a dragon is just a stylized form of a serpent. All right, a dragon is is really when you see this in the scriptures, it's just referring to a serpent. Okay, that's all a dragon is is a serpent. Was cast out that old serpent, like we read about in Genesis chapter three. That's why it says that old serpent. All right, and the serpent, by the way, in Genesis chapter three is is not literally a, a talking serpent. That was, you know, someone of the other nations. But anyway, called the devil and Satan. So what does that make Drake then if he is the, the serpent or the dragon? Because that's what that word really means. You know, let's go here. Um, I got lyrics for this song, Six God by Drake. And here's another thing. So just this in itself, the title, Six God, you'll see something like this and you'll think, oh, it's just, you know, he's the God of the six, the six God, it's all good. No, he's, he's trying to let you know what he really about. Okay, Drake will tell you many times in his songs what he really is about, what he really represents. If you just pay attention and look at his thumbnail, it has a six on it too. And keep in mind that when you see the number six, it doesn't have to be six, six, six at times. Sometimes just six is the number that, you know, when you see this number, depending on who it is, what they're trying to communicate to you is 666, the number of the beast, the number of man. Okay. And you see the praying hands here. You know, that's actually not how you're supposed to pray according to the scriptures is with claps hands. All right. It's, you know, the scriptures never told us that actually. <clears throat> but if we go to the lyrics here too, speaking of 666. On a part here where it says phone back home, ish is hot up in the six boy. If you look, if you read, you know, that's one, two, three, four, five, six sixes that he put, you know, in conjunction here or repetitively here. And that was on purpose, at least in my perspective, because I know what Drake is about. Okay, you don't get to that point where Drake is, unless you've embraced fully the left-hand path. And trust me, they don't have a basic understanding of these things. They, they understand the left-hand path on a higher, much higher level than the average person does, okay? But, you know, what, <laughs> what, what else does this have to do with, you know, this, this lesson? We're going to go into it. One thing I want to grab really quickly is this. So let's go here. This is the two Babylons by Alexander Hislop. And I go here many times when um, we're trying to gain more information about the other nations and their worship of the different pagan deities and how it relates to today. Okay, so I wanted to go into this fully, but just for the sake of time, we may actually go back here because I think I'm going to pick this up for a third part. But just for now, just to show you guys something really quickly, it says here on this um, on this paragraph here, it says, along with the sun as the great fire God and in due time identified him him being Nimrod of the scriptures was the serpent worship. It says in the mythology of the primitive world, says Owen, 
The serpent is universally the symbol of the sun. In Egypt, one of the commonest symbols of the sun or sun god is a disc with a serpent around it, just like we saw many times. Okay, Hathor had a sun disc with a serpent around it. We just saw the winged sun disc with a serpent around it. It says the original reason of that identification seems just to have been that as the sun was the great enlightener of the physical world. So the serpent was held to have been the great enlightener of the spiritual by giving mankind the knowledge, by giving mankind the knowledge of good and evil. So now Maybe you're starting to get an understanding here if you didn't have it before. Why the serpent is worshipped. It all has to do with Genesis chapter 3. At least the serp yeah, serpent worship in general, but serpent worship on the left-hand path. And why that's prevalent to the, the people of the other nations is all because of Genesis chapter 3 and verse 5. For the Most High doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. You shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. So when you see these people call themselves, call themselves gods, that's what they're meaning. Now we know that in Psalms chapter 82, I believe verse 6, that the Most High said that the men of Israel would be as gods. But of course, that word not only was referring to more as being judges or powers, but that's on the right hand path. But when you see Drake referring to himself as the sixth God, <laughs> the sixth God, he ain't talking about no Toronto. He ain't talking about no boroughs of Toronto or all this other stuff that He'll claim, or really, he, a lot of people claim that for him. He really, I don't think he's came out and said it. Probably did, but maybe not. He's talking about the being that great serpent because to him, he's a God that knows both good and evil. He's taken on the fruit of the tree, okay? Of the, of the tree of knowledge. Okay, in their eyes. So it all kind of goes together with the scriptures. And that's why, you know, we go into these things. Because sometimes those may think that the left hand path, you know, is just completely contrary to the scriptures, meaning that you can't find those things here in the scriptures. No, it's, it's here. Um, but that's why you had serpent symbology in the other nations. Okay. Let's read this one more time. It says the original reason of that identification and meaning of the sun disc or the serpent universally being the symbol of the sun. The original reason of that identification seems just to have been that as the sun was the great enlightener of the physical world. So the serpent was held to have been the great enlightener of the spiritual by giving mankind the knowledge of good and evil. Okay. Hopefully that makes sense. All right. Since the serpent created death, he, well, the serpent didn't create death. He gave the doctrine of death to Eve and then Eve embraced that doctrine from his wife. Okay, I mean, uh, Adam embraced that doctrine from his wife, Eve. That brought on death to the world. But what that all also brought on was the mass acceptance of the left-hand path. Okay, the other nations know that their God is not the most high. So therefore, their God is the serpent. Their God is the sun. Okay, the sun God. You understand why they go hard on these things? And why they worship these deities? Because it's, it's contrary of the Most High. And they understand that 
you know, for them to embrace the things that they want to embrace, these are the ideologies that they, they have to take on. Okay, hopefully that makes sense with what the serpent represents. It represents enlightenment, you know, on the spiritual, on the left-hand path normally. Because again, the the um, the serpent could also mean enlightenment on the right-hand path too as well. Okay. It says this, of course, implies tremendous depravity on the part of the ring leader, ringleaders in such a system, considering the period when it began. But such appears to have been the real meaning of the identification. Yeah, I agree with that. At all events, we have evidence, both spiritual and profane, for the fact that the worship of the serpent began side by side with the worship of fire and the sun. Okay, so the sun is likened into the serpent. Okay, and there's many other... Um, Many other examples of this that we can go into too as well. All right, but that's why you have Drake. Drake is the sun god, or he's a, because all of the different celebrities and like I said, politicians or just the, you know, the profane of this world that believe in the left-hand path, they all view themselves as, as gods. Okay, just like Drake said, he the sixth god. It's a reason <laughs> that dude said that, man. Let's get Second Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 3. But I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his sub subtility, so the minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Uh, subtility, excuse me. For if we cometh, for he that cometh preacheth another Yahawashai, whom we have not preached, or if ye receive another spirit which ye have not received, or another gospel which ye have not accepted, ye might well bear well with him. So that's what happens today here in the world. Okay, you've given another Christ, all right. You receiving another spirit. It's not the spirit of Yahweh. It's the spirit of Christ on the left hand path. All right. When I say Christ, I mean that loosely not Christ as a Yahweh, meaning the Messiah of the other nations and those that of our people that even believe um, on that left hand path energy. Okay. Their Messiah is what I'm saying there which ye have not received or another gospel, you know, you get the gospel of this world. You get, you receive another spirit, another, another Christ. Okay. So that's what happens when you embrace the serpent. All right. Hopefully that makes sense. And that's what you embrace. Say if you, you view Drake as an inspiration or you, the, the different things that he says in his songs and different, you know, energies that he pushes out if you embrace that you know as gospel then you know it's gonna bear well with you all right and let me go to the word serpent here in the quote-unquote new testament g3789 ophis ophis it says snake serpent or serpent 14 times with the ancients, the serpent was an emblem of cunning and wisdom. The serpent who deceived Eve was regarded by the Jews as the devil. Okay. Um, probably from G3700 through the idea of sharpness of vision, a snake figuratively as a type of sly cunning an artful malicious person especially Satan. Okay, and that's what the serpent represents. That's what the, um, the quote-unquote sun god uh, represents too as well. But also, to kind of go back here in the, the relation to the sun and why you see the, the serpent and the sun and what that represents too is it's just light or enlightenment. Remember we read here that 
the original reason of the identification seems to just been that as the sun was a great enlightener of the physical world. So you know how the sun enlightens or the sun lights up the physical world from a physical standpoint the light the sun lights up the world on the spiritual side the light or the knowledge of the left hand path in this different ideologies comes from the sun too as well or the serpent the great enlightener of the spiritual giving mankind a knowledge of good and evil all right but that's what happened with Adam and Eve. Remember, they knew good and evil. All right, they knew the different ideologies on the left-hand path. Before that, they were naked. They were green. They didn't understand all of that until they went off. Now, to understand uh, what this means from a standpoint of the sun and the light, let's get Isaiah chapter 14 and 12. It says, how... How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nation? So if you look at the word Lucifer here, what does Lucifer mean? This is H1966, Hel Lel. Let's see. Strong's H1966, Hel Hel. Hel Hillel. <laughs> so Lucifer says light bearer. Lucifer is a light bearer or the enlightener of the different ideologies of the left hand path. The shining one, the morning star, Lucifer. Okay. That's what Lucifer means. It just means a light bearer. All right. It says in the sense of brightness. So that's why you have different sun gods worship them that's what that really means okay it doesn't mean at least if you understand what it truly means like a drake does it calls itself drake or a serpent the sun in that relation to the sun is not the actual star in the sun itself as as in you look at the sun and worship it it's talking about the different ideologies of the left hand path like we said and different things of this world that's pushed out nowadays, the um, LGBTQ and um, you can just do whatever you want and women's bodies, you know, my body, my choice and, you know, all these different things. OK, those things are the light to the other nation, the sun, the source of enlightenment. So hopefully this is all making sense, um, the symbology there. But again, on the right-hand path, you have Yahawashai, which is a horn too as well. He is the brightness. He is the sun. But again, that's on the right-hand path. Do not ever confuse these things because there's a huge difference. Okay. This scriptures, these scriptures, these are the, the light to us, to our people but on the right-hand path only, okay? But, well, we know it, it teaches us what not to do on the left-hand path, but let's look at an example. This is Habakkuk chapter three and verse four. It says, and his brightness was as the light, referring to Yahweh. He had horns coming out of his hand. See that hand? I mean, we see the, uh, excuse me, we see the horns there. And there was the hiding of his power. So, you know, I was referring to the chariots coming down, beaming that energy down when this place is going to be destroyed. But that's a whole nother topic. But point is, is that we, and we also know that Yahweh Shai was for, referred to as the morning star. Okay. And also in, do I have that pulled up? Let's pull it up. So in Malachi, I believe chapter four and verse two, it says that, but unto you that fear my name shall the son of righteousness arise with healing in his wings and ye shall go forth and grow up as calves of the stall. Yahweh 
was referred to as the son, S-U-N, of righteousness. You see, so we have a choice to make either to embrace the scriptures, okay, as our true doctrine and, you know, this the son of righteousness to embrace him or we can embrace the serpent of the left hand path, the sun god, Apis, Apollo, and Adonis, so on and so forth. But you see how they both have you know, they both have, uh, I'll say they, they both have different meanings just on two different sides, a right hand path and a left hand path. And what these things mean, I could go deeper, but, you know, we just we're going to keep going. Um, we're going to pick up another part of oh, the last thing too. just if you thought I was reaching with Drake, just keep in mind, again, all of the the different. Um, artists and rappers and all these people a lot of times are given code names and that it's done on purpose and I think most brothers and sisters could have made this connection by now I've got a Adonis Creed we know Creed 3 just came out not too long ago at the time I'm, I'm recording this um, it says Adonis Donnie Creed born Adonis Johnson is a fictional protagonist of the Creed trilogy Creed, the first Creed came out in 2015, Creed 2 in 2018, and Creed 3 in 2023. The follow-up franchise to the Rocky, and that's a whole nother, we may do that in part three. Rocky film series is a reason that Rocky is named Rocky. The characters played by Michael B. Jordan in all three installments. It says, in the fictional setting of the films, Donnie is an illegitimate son of the late and former world champion Apollo. So remember, Apollo is the sun god, and his son is Adonis. Just like what? Just like Drake. Drake is Apollo. Drake is the sun god. He's the serpent. And now his son is named Adonis. Adonis is the sun. Okay, S O N. And depending on how you're looking at it, S U N too. All right, because again, that's what, and and that's <laughs> that's how they re make these things relate, man. Um, that you know, even in this movie, Apollo, you know, Adonis, these are all you know Greek gods, and these are the names that they were given. It's really this movie is quite Masonic if you really know what you're looking at. So you have Adonis, again, this is a quote unquote Greek God, but his equivalent in the Mesopotamian, the Mesopotamian equivalent is Tammuz. And we know Tammuz is in the scriptures in uh, Ezekiel chapter eight and verse 14. All right, cause he's the son, S-O-N, okay? But you know what, that's pretty much it for this installment uh, next time we have some other things to go into as well um, Lord willing this was edifying but until the next time I bid you all my shalom